Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Bible study. Grace Lutheran Church and School in Sandy, Utah. Great to see everybody here alive. And uh, thank you for those who will be watching later uh, the video at home. Let's pray and get started. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we thank and we praise you for your word, uh, which is light and life left to our own devices and our own broken sinfulness. We would put ourselves first and pursue things that please us. We thank you that you heal us with your law and raise us with your gospel in Christ so that we, your people, are formed and shaped to be the children you would have us be. Today, as we study, bless and be with us. And grant that we uh, would be changed and transformed and grown into followers of Jesus who confess him before the nations. We pray in his holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Very good. We're in Luke chapter 8. And we'll do a little bit of review and then move forward. We talked about the women accompanying Jesus, the parable of the sower, and uh, the explanation uh, that followed. Um, and that moved forward into a discussion of um, women disciples in the New Testament. Uh, the study Bible provides, I keep saying study Bible and forgetting to mention what I'm talking about. Uh, when I say study Bible, for those in, watching the video at home, uh, the study Bible I'm talking about is a specific edition that would that is helpful for this class. You don't have to have to have it, but you'll be able to read the notes if you don't have it. Um, it's the Concordia Study Bible ESV English Standard Version. Uh, that's uh, available through ConcordiaPublishingHouse.org. It can be sent to the home. They have another older version. That's the Concordia Study Bible NIV. Um, that's not the one I'm using. I'm using the ESV. So that would give you access to the notes that I'm talking about. And again, it's not something you have to have, but it's awful handy and it is a really good um, resource. A lamp under a jar. We talked about uh, Jesus' words here that nobody lights a lamp and covers it. Um, in the context of, you know, the one who loves Jesus keeps his commandments. Uh, Christianity is a lived faith, not a spectator sport. Jesus' mother and brothers, we talked about that as well. Uh, his mother and brothers are those who hear the word of God and, uh, and do it. That's family to Jesus. And um, we're going to move ahead with uh, Jesus calms a storm and heals a man with a demon in the context of the setups that have come so far, uh, mainly that he has authority to forgive sins, and that's why he does these other things. Yeah. So one day he got into a boat with the disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side um, of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, uh, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. And they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who, who then is this, that he commands even winds and water? And they obey him. Um, this Luke's version is shorter uh, than we have uh, elsewhere and very to the point. What do you suppose he is asking when he says, or not what is he asking, but um, to what is he referring when he says, yeah, what's the reference to the question, where is your faith? What prompted that question? What's the issue? He's present. Do I? He is present. He's enough. present, and that's enough. Good. He said he, we're going to the other side, and they didn't believe it. Right. Let us go across to the other side. They they didn't believe it. They thought it was all over. Yeah. Anything else? Good. I think if what well, maybe what you're getting at is the sort of the syntax. Like you can formulate that question a couple of ways. You can say, "What happened to your faith? Where did it go?" Or you could say, "In what is your faith?" Place. Yeah, yeah. In what is your faith place? Right, right. Because why this grave 
concern, you know. Um, it's a fascinating thing. What is it that they fear? Death, it sounds like. Death. Yeah. Drowning. Drowning. Yeah. Death, drowning, not being in control. Right? Yeah, it's, it's very right. And their faith seems to be placed in this life. My hope, my security are in this life. Quick, Master, awaken and save us. Lest we lose this life. And Jesus' question, you know, hits all of those. I told you we're going to the other side. Where's your faith? And you're looking for safety and security in this life. You're looking in the wrong place. Where's your faith? Yeah. Paul in Philippians is in prison. You'll hear this in the uh, epistle lesson today during the divine service. He's imprisoned, probably in Rome. Um, could be Caesarea, could be Ephesus, but probably in Rome. And um, knows he could lose his life. And so his concern, however, is not for his own safety and security. His dilemma is, well, I would love to go home and be with Christ. That'd be awesome. But for your sake, I know that it would also be good for me to be here. But he doesn't focus, you know, on, um, I would rather stay, I would rather not go through the pain of whatever kills me. I would rather, you know, like that. If he stays here, it would be for their sake. Um, and that's not the perspective that's being displayed here uh, in, in Luke 8. And who is this that commands even winds and water and they obey him? Well, um, it would be the guy uh, who has already forgiven sins, um, who has raised the widow's son, who's healed the centurion servant from a distance, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> but I think, too, if you think about it, it's still kind of early on in his ministry and them being with him. So they haven't quite grasped exactly who he is and what he's there to do. Uh -huh. or, cap or capable of, for that matter. <laughs> uh -huh. so, yeah. Um, yeah, he is. Um, I'm, I'm paging back just to kind of quickly look at there's there's been, you know, um, a lot going on there. There's the. Um, man healed. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, not healed, has a demon cast out of him. Um, in front of them, Jesus goes around healing many, including Simon's mother, right in front of all of them, um, cleanses a leper, heals a paralytic, um, argues with the authorities that he's Lord of the Sabbath, so he has, it's fine for him to heal and so forth. The man with the withered hand is the pointed reference there. Um and uh, ministers to a multitude, all the crowd sought to touch him, power came out of him and healed them all. Um, he heals the centurion servant I mentioned from a distance, raises the widow's son from the dead. Who is this that can calm the evening, the storm? Yeah, uh, and they do, the apostles do struggle, you know, with this kind of he does all these things, and they just still, especially in Mark's gospel, um, he's the Colossus of Nazareth, and they never get it. They kind of never get it until they're, and, and that's going to play out here as well in Luke, that they're pretty consistently wrong about who he is, even the ones closest to him, until the resurrection. And then, oh, you know, um, and the like bigger light goes on. off. <laughs> yeah, if you have the spirit comes upon them, yeah, yeah. He commands even winds and water, uh, and uh, and they obey him. All right, they sailed uh, to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, uh, there met him a man from the city who had demons, plural. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, 
and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me, for he had commanded the unclean spirit coming out of the man. And then we have this kind of editorial from Luke. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Some pretty specific terminology. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake uh, and were uh, drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had, been, uh, who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned to the man from whom the demons had gone, begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Well, let's talk about this very interesting situation. In the land of the Gerasenes, opposite Galilee, so they cross over the Sea of Galilee, that's where the storm happens. And when Jesus had stepped out on land, a very specific movement reference, he steps out on land, and boom, he's met there uh, by a man from the city who had <coughs> demons. Jesus commands, and this also, again, very interesting. The man doesn't say, will you heal me? Jesus sees the situation. Yeah, come out of him. <laughs> he's just blat you know he just hits him with power right come out of him he, he uh, cries out falls down says what have you to do with me jesus son of the most high god i beg you do not torment me so this is really intriguing because you'll bump into people who will say well jesus in the gospels he never says he's god well even the demons say he's god right now, you know, and even his uh, worst opponents know that he's claiming to be God, which is why they, they constantly want to stone him for blasphemy. Um, but what is this, you know, issue going on here? I beg you, do not torment me. And um, they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. What's going on there? Basically, they don't want to be sent back to hell. <laughs> okay. That's what I think. They want to delay their time before they get sent to the lake of fire. Yeah, right. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the demons stand already condemned. There's no second chance. Um, you know, Hebrews says that angels long to look into these things, these things being the plan of salvation for mankind who does have in Christ that second chance. Um, they don't, they're condemned, they're, uh, they're done. And so um, there's this element of, is it over? You know, don't send us to the, uh, to the abyss. They don't know what the plan is, but they know what their judgment is. And they are not ready for it, oddly enough, even though they know what it is. Um, and look at this address. Jesus, son of the most high God. Well, you know, what an incredibly respectful, they have no other choice, <laughs> right? Reference to God, son of the most high God. And the recognition that Jesus has power over them i beg you don't torment that's all they can do they can't prevent it they can do whatever he wants to do yeah. 
almost as if they're asking for mercy as well. <laughs> right? I beg you, do not torment me. Right. Um, what's the story on the pigs? A herd of pigs was feeding nearby. Well, I think they think that if he commands them to go into the pigs, then they won't have to, you know, go to the faith. They know that awaits them. They can continue to wreak havoc in some shape or form. Yeah. While still on Earth. Well, they're in a they're in a non-Jewish region. Yeah. So they're now down to the south by the Decapolis, and these are not just mm -hmm. pigs randomly wandering around. They're herded pigs, so they they belong to the people, so these are not Jewish people. Right? Yeah, it is a, a largely Gentile area. It wouldn't have been exclusively Gentile, so these are unclean animals in the land. They're not supposed to be there. Yeah, they want to go into the pigs, unclean. And um, it's kind of bizarre. The herd rushes over the steep bank into the lake and they're drowned. That's super weird. Now what? You know. It's sort of a fitting end though, right? To the, to the abomination in the land. Now the pigs and the demons are gone. Well, presumably, at least for a time. So they come back and find something. Uh, there is the parable that Christ tells in... I don't remember if it's in Mark's gospel. Uh, no, 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 no. It's in, I think it's in Matthew. The, um, you know, the, the swept house. Yes. Right? And so with the, as far as the reference to the abyss, um, Jesus kind of described, well, you know, if, if a demon is cast out and a, and, a, and a house is swept and made clean and the demon wanders for a little bit through dry places, and then decides that he's going to go back and finds that there's still nothing in the house. He'll bring all his friends and it'll be worse than it was in the beginning. Yep. And so Jesus casts out the demons. He removes uncleanness from the land. And he's done it with the leper. And he's allowed unclean people to touch him. And he shows no problem with that whatsoever. Because he, Jesus is the one who cleanses. So he casts out demons. He removes uncleanness. He shows mercy. He has what power over evil. There's a lot going on in this little episode. I'm thinking it's something to do with the water as well. You know, they they run into the lake. They're drowned. drowned. They're drowned. They're off a cliff and drowned in the water below. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yes, uh, can such possession happen today? And if so, how is it recognized? Not to a Christian. Not to a Christian, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but to Gentiles or to uh, to uh, to those who welcome it, it certainly can. Yeah, and um, let's come back to that in just a second as we work on this list. He casts out demons. He removes uncleanness. He shows mercy. He has power over evil. Um, anything else Jesus is doing here? He forgave the man and told and sent him home. No, that, that I mean, that's the healing or the casting out, right? Just like all of the healing miracles is always about forgiveness. So look, let's put that in the form of a verb. So we have he forgives. Yeah, he has compassion. He forgives. He also sends. What's he tell the guy to go do? Tell how much God has done for you. Yeah. So basically, go be go witness. Go witness. Yeah, that's a strong theme in Luke. 
there's always this uh, witness angle keeps coming up and coming up and coming up throughout the gospel of Luke. And it'll be a really big deal uh, near the end. Yeah. He goes Jesus. back and forth on that though. Cause sometimes it, sometimes it's like, don't tell anybody. And then sometimes it's go tell. Right. Right. Don't tell anybody. I'm the Christ. He will say, but this is go tell how much God has done for you. Uh, kind of a thing. It goes right on the basis of, he wants people to believe on the basis of the word and not on the basis of oh, what a cool trick, <laughs> you know? Yeah. He forgives sin He sends witnesses, right? Because eventually he'll sell, send out disciples, tell them go proclaim. Yeah. So all, all of this really great stuff is going on. Tell me about the, the people. So they come and they find the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they rejoice. No. See, isn't that weird? They don't rejoice. They're afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. There's more witnessing going on. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. What is this reaction? Well, I think it's a little bit different than like healing a leper or... Something like that. I mean, the guy was demon possessed and he'd been crazy since who know how long, you know, because of those demons. And people associate demons with fear. And, you know, yeah. if you drove them out where, you know, yeah, they went to the pigs, but then what, you know, they're demons. Is it fair <laughs> to our list up here to say he? generates fear because all of a sudden Jesus was pretty pretty cuddly until a minute ago he does all these things we like cast out demons removes uncleanness he shows mercy has power over evil forgives sin sends witnesses and we're all yay warm and fussy Jesus go get him he generates fear wait what Why are they? He clearly generates fear. The entire countryside is so afraid. They ask him, and I'm sure it was gently, to depart from them. Okay, so what's going on? All of a sudden, it's not like Buddy Jesus anymore. It's like, I'm terrified. What's going on? The, the fall into the hands of the living God is a terrifying thing. Yeah, it is. They've witnessed. Legit. It, right, it is. It is. You know, Proverbs repeatedly says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, um, yeah, what's going on with the people? They don't rejoice. They don't think this is great. Well, I think it's worth observing that they wanted the pigs, <laughs> you know, yeah. so they, they're probably not really pleased with that. But also this guy who just shows up on the beach and deals with this lunatic, you know, guy who runs off naked into the desert and breaks chains and stuff like that. And Jesus uh, from the from a third party observer just has a little dialogue with the guy and suddenly the pig, I mean, imagine standing there. I, I don't know what you would see, but it would not be normal. Right. And, um, and you know, they're probably fine not to have the guy, but now what do you have? I mean, and, and I mean, I guess the thing about Jesus is at least he seems open to talk. You know, you can't really reason with this demoniac 
but you can ask Jesus, hey, could you could you leave? <laughs> you know, um, but yes. but I mean, there's clearly something supernatural going on, and they just don't want any of it. I think. It's yeah, fair. Yeah, you know, one minute this guy's breaking chains, the next minute he's you know ready to be your accountant or, or whatever. He's he's a he's just clothed and in his right mind, ready to go. Useful part of society. And it happened at the command of uh, of Jesus. So they're freaked out. Yeah, yes. So, so where did the demons go after the pigs were drowned? The Bible doesn't say. Yeah. It doesn't say. And it makes you wonder. It makes you wonder. I would I would imagine too, if I were there, um, and, and this man was demon possessed, um, and and Jesus sends the demons away, gets rid of them, and then this man goes away seeing as he always was yeah. where, before he was demon-possessed. Good to go. What can that man do to me? Right. I mean, that would have, that would certainly be a fear. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not demon-possessed. I know that, but I mean, if he can make demons disappear and go away, what, what can he do to me? Yeah. You know, we, we like this part because it's gospel. Mm -hmm. And not this part because it's law. Well, I think if, if you want an analogy, think back to when it's the Lord of the Rings, when Gandalf finds Sam outside the window and he brings him in and says, you've been eavesdropping? And he's like, no, please don't turn me into anything unnatural, you know? Right, right. And it's like, you know, what he was just saying. And yeah. Right. No. So God's word has both law and gospel. <laughs> and it's really important to understand the proper distinction between law and gospel. Um, if you if you don't, pretty much everything else that's wrong, come heretical, comes out of it sooner or later, right? Um, the law, the law in God's word, um, we talk about uses or functions. Originally, Luther and the reformers talked about um, offices. Uh, so initially, uh, they would talk about the law having two uses. Um, this is especially Luther. Um, and number one is um, civil order. Civil order. So the first use of the law is for good order in society. And an example of this would be a stop sign stop sign the idea is uh you will stop and therefore won't you know plow through an intersection potentially run into a pedestrian or another car or someone will plow through an intersection and run into you uh that's the idea it's it's there for good order in society um because you know so society requires order to function um and so as uh, a use for civil order. It applies to believers and unbelievers equally alike. It's everybody's needs uh, needs their behavior uh, restrained for good order. Uh, and then the second use of the law um, is to make us aware of our sin and that the penalty is death. Like God told Adam, don't eat the fruit of the tree of, you know, it's in the middle of the garden, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God is life. Separate from God, you get death. That's the consequence of sin. The wages of sin is death. So the, the two uses that, again, this is er, you know earlier, um, well, Luther kind of sticks with this. Anyway, that's more detail than maybe is necessary, but Civil order and sin that shows our sin, the penalties that, and again, that second use is for everybody, believers and unbelievers alike. Now, Luther would talk about, and, and so did Philip Melanchthon as well, um, would talk about the mandatum or command of God as a, as a, a function of the law, but not necessarily a use and later Philip Melanchthon will develop this into a third use of the law, and then it comes out, it's present in 
uh, formula of Concord Solid Declaration 6, both in the epitome uh, and the Solid Declaration of the Formula of Concord 6, uh, as a guide. And for some reason, people like to argue about whether or not there's a fair use. And I, I, if that's a hobby, I guess, whatever. But um, it's pretty clear that the Bible is filled with uh, the commands of God to do good works. And then it specifies what a good work is. Love your neighbor as yourself. And it's not that, you know, like Semper accused that. The law always accuses so these are, this is always going to happen. The law is always going to accuse us. Um, but sometimes it also teaches us by guiding us into what a good work actually is. So that, you know, though we are regenerate, we are still in this flesh, this body of, of death. And would want to think that a good work is whatever pleases us. So uh, according to that, so that, that guide function, uh, we need to be guided in our sanctification. Now, whether you call that an office, a command, a precept, whatever, <laughs> it's there. The law does uh, these things. Luther believed that the guide, guidance of the law was always present in these other two. Because they are. It is always present in these other two. Um, and Melanchthon just felt more comfortable separating it out and talking about it you know, individually. So it didn't get lost in the mix. Okay, fine. But the point here is that this is what the law does. Um, the gospel you know, um, makes a lot. The law kills. The gospel makes a lot. Makes sense. Makes. The law um, accuses the gospel forgives in Christ. The law cannot make alive, the law cannot forgive. See, and it's really, really important to distinguish those things. So yes, Jesus has come with all of this gospel, but they recognize in him also the law, which generates fear. They are they stand accused. Um, Isaiah does this in uh, the, the throne room vision. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and I've seen the Lord. Okay? He's afraid. He thinks he's done. The angel comes with the hot coal, touches his lips. Now he's good to go. Um, Peter does this at one point. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. You know, this is a normal, actually a very normal response um, to the presence of the Holy One. Okay. Um, John writes in his epistle, I think it's the first epistle, um, that fear is the expectation of punishment. That's this recognition, you know, it's why the law drives you to repentance. It's one of the reasons why. Um, the law drives you to repent because, uh, obviously, you come to the realization that you've offended a holy God, but the wages of sin is death. It breaks your stone heart, you know, your insistence on uh, your reliance on self, self-justification and all of these things. Right? The gospel sweeps in and makes alive and forgives. The law condemns, and those things are very different things. And if, if we conflate or confuse those, we'll end up with a system of, for example, cooperation with the Holy Spirit in our justification, which does not happen. It's not possible. It's not happened. That's a conflation. Or we'll end up with saying, yeah, we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. As long as we keep these ordinances uh, baptism in the Lord's Supper and demonstrate with our external behavior or internal faith. Oh. I mean, there may also be a way of, of articulating that in a real, I mean, I mean, almost a natural law sort of way, right? Like, so these, so these, these gatherings, they don't know Jesus, right? 
but and, and and before they were living in a situation that was negative like it was bad they were making the best they could with this guy who was yowling and running around and all of that but they had sort of made some kind i mean they were at least living that way but it was bad they, they it wasn't safe it wasn't good but they were they were lumping it um jesus comes he casts out these demons but from, from a natural law standpoint, like they still don't know if they're safe. They still don't know if they've got something or someone good in front of them. So from, from this idea of generating fear, you're just talking about natural man, partly the question is, am, am I self-sufficient to, to have a good life, you know, to be safe forever? And the answer for most people, even pagan people all over the world is no, I am not, I'm clearly not God. Bad stuff happens. People around me die. I'm going to die. I get sick. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not okay. But this idea of self-justification, you know, you can say, well, I've got everything I need. I'm going to say I'm okay. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to look kind of like living with this demoniac, you know, like, nah, you know, we can, we can live this way. Like, it's fine. We're in control, but you're not really. Um, and in, in the long term, we kind of face that same thing, even as Christians, like when you're talking about self-justification well you know i've got these sins but it's fine it's not really a problem um it, it is a it is a submissive thing i mean to be confronted with the law that says no you're not okay you're not okay jesus makes it okay like if you look in the big picture the only way that you're good i'm just we'll just maybe use that term is to be in god's favor living forever without sin without death um, the only way you're going to get that is through Jesus. Anything other than that, you're either deluding yourself um, and you're either trying to get along even with the holy will of God, like, oh yeah, I can do that, or to try and get by without it. None of that is the gospel. None of that is good. And you are tricking yourself potentially to your ultimate demise. Right. So I, I guess I was just maybe trying to maybe articulate that also in yeah. kind of this visceral natural law way you know what is law and what is gospel yeah. when you really think about your eternal disposition right and they they you know they've had to deal with the um the possessed man but they thought they kind of had it under control ish i mean sure it wasn't ideal it's bad for tourism not fun <laughs> to be on the beach uh but uh overall you know, we kind of got this. Jesus steps off the boat. No, no, he's got this. Wham. And they're like, really ultimately faced with this existential crisis. Wait a minute. I'm not in control. He's in control. You know, please leave. So we can be in control again. <laughs> so we can be in control again. There's a there is an element that is still kind of crying out for safety and security in this life. You know, you would want the reaction to be, oh, um, the people of the Gerasenes and the people of the surrounding region, they fell on their knees and asked him, what must we do to be saved? That's the ending you're looking for, not go away, you freak us out. Uh, that's you know and, and and there is an element of law in their reaction right because the first thing that we want to do now is go Ooh, when have i done that in my own life right you know when have i done boy i i i had i had this all figured out and the lord's gonna mess it up my, my own nice compartmentalized God just broke out. Like he stepped off the boat out of the box and went wham. And I'm a little freaked out, right? So we want to kind of look for that um, in our own lives, not as its own end, but as step one of falling to one's knees. Yeah, what must I do to be? Savior, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, or Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You know, this gospel, this gospel goodness that sweeps in. And look, 
look at the predominance of the gospel in this story, right? Just even, even sort of numerically in a list, which is crass, okay, fine. But it's sort of a metaphor. It works, you know, the gospel predominates. The, but the, the law is for sure there. And they're like, nah, go, you know, can't cope. I want to be in control. And you just literally showed me I'm completely not in control. Yeah. In other words, sort of like the apostles, uh, disciples in the boat with the storm. I'm not in control. I literally just learned I'm totally not in, in control. And I want to be in control. I want things safe and secure in this life. Now, their, their response is do something. Their response is go away. But it's not dissimilar in the human desire for calm and control and don't rattle my cage and don't, you know, da da da. And he's a complete cage rattler. He's just, that's nothing but. And he rattles your cage so that you would be turned to him. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll tell you what, it's getting late. Let's pause there. Great stuff. Lot to think about here. In, uh... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the three little pigs, you know, that story pops pops into my mind. This is the complete opposite, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I just, I love this. I love thinking about it. The more it's got all these layers that as you peel back, there's just more there, more there, more, more there. Uh, let's pray and close, though, because we got to wrap it up time-wise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we thank and praise you uh, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, um, and that uh, he has come to us, in fact, both with law and gospel, for uh, ultimately our salvation, the laws to drive us to our knees and cry out, you know, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. It breaks us of our own self-idolatry and, and, and makes us realize we are not in control. We are definitely not our own God. Uh, and that our uh, proper and appropriate response is humble submission uh, to the forgiveness and mercy that is ours in Jesus Christ. Bless us, Lord. Uh, and, and grant us strength to resist the flesh and the desires that come with all of that. And give us also strength and courage to be faithful witnesses to Christ, to go and proclaim um, how much uh, you've done for us in him. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for joining. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining and watching online. Um, have a great day in the Lord. God willing, we'll be back next week. So long.